Alright guys, how's it going? It's been a little while since my last video. I've been working outside of the channel and I've also been working on a video that is clearly going to take a very, very long time to get complete. So I thought in the meantime, I better get something out. And I noticed that there's been a real lack of news on Ryzen over the past couple of weeks. So what I'm going to do in this video is just recap what we know Maybe go over one or two little things that you weren't aware of and I will also throw in a little bit of speculation on one or two Ryzen points. The big Ryzen reveal came last month when the French magazine Canard PC Hardware benchmarked a Ryzen engineering sample. Now up until this point all we had was AMD's own benchmarks so in a way this is the first independent benchmark of the Ryzen CPU. Now the Ryzen CPU that was benchmarked was an engineering sample which had a base clock speed of 3.15 GHz and a maximum boost clock of 3.4 GHz. And from AMD's recent New Horizon event, we know that the slowest Ryzen CPU will have a base clock of 3.4 GHz with turbos going at least up to 3.9 and probably quite a bit higher than that. This engineering sample may also have a bug in the micro op cache and with SMT or simultaneous multi-threading. So basically speaking, the Ryzen sample that Canard PC has is pretty much worst case scenario. So keeping that in mind, let's take a look at the benchmarks. So the first set of benchmarks was a bunch of highly threaded applications. So that's stuff like encoding in Handbrake, W Prime, which searches for prime numbers, and of course stuff like Blender, which we've seen before. So a bunch of highly threaded apps which will of course perform much better on high core count CPUs. And right at the top, we can see the Core i7-6900K, which of course has eight cores and 16 threads. 14.6% behind is the AMD Ryzen engineering sample. Now you might think 14.6% behind, that is quite a gap, especially when you look at the Core i7-6800K, which is only 11% behind. So in this case, AMD's 8 cores are actually closer to Intel's 6 cores, but you've got to remember the clock speeds. According to Canard PC, their Ryzen sample never passed 3.3 GHz, whereas the 6900K and 6800K are likely running around 3.5 GHz. And if we just equalise those clock speeds, which means the Ryzen sample would be 3.5 GHz, it would now only be 8% behind the i7-6900K. 8% behind at the same clock speed is a pretty good result. And 3.5 GHz is very likely to be as low as it gets for Ryzen's all-core turbo. And it could, of course, be quite a bit higher. If we assume those values are correct, that is 3.5 GHz for the 6900K and 3.3 GHz for the Ryzen sample with its buggy hyperthreading and buggy micro-op cache would need a 3.8 GHz all-core turbo in order to beat the 6900K in these highly multi-threaded benchmarks. So far, so good. We all expect Ryzen to be a monster at multi-threaded benchmarks, so no surprise there. But what about when it comes to gaming? Now recently, AMD's gaming performance has been a real Achilles heel. The FX CPUs are simply no good at it. And even the 8-core bulldozer CPUs frequently lose out to Intel's 4-thread i3s. But we finally got a bunch of gaming benchmarks. The author of the article at Canard PC said that very few of the games used more than 4 cores. And this is quite evident as the 6700K is 10% ahead of the 6900K. They also mentioned that the games were sensitive to frequency, which is actually pretty unusual when it comes to gaming. So at first glance, these results do not look very good. The Ryzen sample comes in behind the i5-6600K, just by a couple of percent, but obviously that doesn't look all that impressive. But the thing here is, the 6600K is likely running between 10 and 15% higher clock speed. And based on these results, you would expect a true Ryzen CPU to beat the 6600K. It doesn't look very good against the 6700K, which is 21.5% faster. However, on average, it does have 25% higher clock speed. It is very difficult to figure out what is going on with these benchmarks. For example, the 6700K is 8% ahead of the 4790K, which should have a slightly higher turbo. 
Now, obviously the Skylake CPU has higher IPC and probably faster memory as well. And that is likely why it has an 8% lead. Looking down the bottom at the FX8370 and the A12-9800, you might have expected a bigger gap between those two CPUs. Even though the 9800 is a bit more modern and has higher IPC compared to the FX, that rather small gap, given that it only has half the cores and should be running at lower clock speeds, that very small gap doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Again, I'm wondering here if this is about memory speed and if these games really stress the memory as well. A lot of people are going to look at this and think, this is terrible, but this is nowhere near what I expect to see from Ryzen in gaming. And in fact, I believe that Ryzen will be as good as the 6900K at least. And one reason why I believe this is going back to the New Horizon event, AMD's James Pryor said this. Yeah, absolutely. So side by side, head to head, we've got our Ryzen 8 core 16 thread processor, 3.4 gigahertz with an NVIDIA Titan X Pascal graphics card okay. running 4K ultra in-game settings. So the highest of the high quality. Everything maxed out. Maxed out okay. as much as we can. Yes. Side by side with an Intel Core i7 6900K retail configuration right. with that same Titan X graphics card. The so, same graphics card, different processors, right. 4K resolution battlefield. Yep. Uh, should we head into? Yeah, let's w check it out here and check it out. So you should see as we go through the different uh, different parts of the demo that as the big explosions happen, as the uh, intensity increases that we're uh, running the same frame rates, if not a little bit better on the Ryzen system, right. depending on where you are in the, in the game. Running a little bit better on the Ryzen system. Now you would of course expect AMD's marketing guys would put their own products in the best light. However, Ari Altman, the owner and editor of the Tech Buyers Guru website, who was at CES, also said this, we played through each scene and the Ryzen system averaged about one to two FPS higher than the 6900K system. We are talking about besting an ultra high-end Intel chip in a game that is very core sensitive. Now this is actually quite important because 1 to 2 frames per second obviously doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're running at 4K, even with a Titan X, and that's actually an interesting point, AMD demoed this with a Titan X instead of Vega, so have a think about that one. But getting back to Ryzen, a couple of FPS at 4K resolution, where the graphics card should be the limiting factor, and yet the Ryzen CPU is still able to push it just that little bit further. This could mean something. I've had to think about this, and it could be down to AMD's smart prefetch and neural net prediction, where basically speaking, the CPU is learning to anticipate future decisions based on what has gone before. This could potentially contribute one or two frames per second, even as far as 4K resolution. Right, so last up is the power usage. And even though I just said that gaming was AMD's Achilles heel, power usage has obviously been a big problem recently as well. When you consider Bulldozer, in fact, it's more like a body rather than an Achilles heel. And here you can see what I mean with the FX8370 taking a dubious pride of place at the top of this chart. What is really interesting, of course, is the Ryzen sample comes in just below the i7-6900K by 3 watts. So AMD has achieved all this while maintaining similar power consumption to Intel. Given that Intel's 14 nanometer process is supposedly superior, this points to some really innovative and very impressive architectural advances by AMD. The process point is a good one though because it's all well and good having the CPU performance, but in the past, it's safe to say that Global Foundries hasn't always performed as well as they could do. So for some people, the worry is that AMD simply might not be able to manufacture enough of these CPUs to go around. But this time, with Global Foundries 14 nanometer process, I have no such worries. All of AMD's 14 nanometer PC products are being manufactured at Global Foundries Fab 8. It is a massive, highly advanced complex capable of producing around 60,000 wafers per month once fully ramped. Global Foundries has been in mass production of 14 nanometers for around a year. And over time, the process improves and yields improve. A recent article at the EE Times India, back in September last year, where they talked about Global Foundries 7 nanometers, also had a very interesting snippet of information on Global Foundries current 14 nanometer process. Now what they're talking about here is defect densities. In this case, below 0.8 parts per million. Now, we can see here what I talked about. This is a time scale. So on the left, you could be talking maybe two years ago. And over time, the defect densities just continue to drop. 
until now, this was the initial 14 nanometer, the LPE process. The process that AMD is using is called 14 LPP. So probably around about this time last year, you're looking at a defect density of 0.3 per square centimeter. Over the year, the defect density drops down to below 0.1. I'll just show you what this actually means for yield, and I will leave a link to this in the description below. This is one of the die yield calculators that I use. Now you've got die width and die height. For the example of Ryzen, I'm going to assume around 200 square millimeters based on the single die shot that we have seen. Most people reckon around 160 to 200 square millimeters in size. So I'm going to go with the worst case here of 200 square millimeters. Even though the die is clearly rectangular, for the purpose of this, I'm just going to go with a square. So all you have to do is 200 and take the square root of that, which means that each side would be 14.14, round up to 14.15 millimeters. Now we're just going to leave the scribe as it is. Now the wafer diameter, these 200 millimeter wafers are the old smaller wafers. Almost all of the cutting edge manufacturing is done on 300 millimeter wafers today. We're going to leave the edge loss as well. And at this part is where we put in the defect density. So we're going to go with 0.3, which would be back here. Click on calculate. And that would be 56.5% yield. So for every wafer of Zen, there would be 279 die candidates, but only 158 would be good. For a die of this size, that is not great. But if we now go back and say, well, let's not even go with 0.8 parts per million. Let's just go with half of this 0.3. So 0.15, click on calculate. And we are now up to 208 good die per wafer. Now, I feel that this is being pretty conservative because this is actually around half of what the Global Foundries is claiming today. So with the biggest likely die size of 200 square millimeters and with a yield of only around 75%, there should be 208 good dies, good rise in CPUs on each wafer. Now we already saw that 60,000 wafers per month is the approximate capacity. AMD is of course using wafers on Polaris, but it's probably not an awful lot. And AMD is by far and away Global Foundry's largest customer, especially on the cutting edge fabrication nodes. So basically speaking, most of this wafer capacity is AMD's if they want it. But let's for argument's sake, and again being very conservative, let's just say that Ryzen has half of this or 30,000 wafers per month capability. 30,000 wafers per month multiplied by 208 good die on the wafer would be 6.24 million dies, 6.24 million Ryzen chips every single month once it has fully ramped. Multiply that figure by 12 for the entire year and you have 75 million Ryzen CPUs. Now the PC market has been in decline for very many years, as we can see here, but it is still around 270 million units every year. Now this is laptops and PCs, of course. The price of PCs has also been dropping over the years, as those people who are buying PCs are now being split into two. The vast majority of PC sales are extremely low end, even worse than you can imagine probably and Ryzen will clearly be targeting the opposite end of the spectrum, the high end and the ultra high end. The reality of that market is it is not a huge amount of units, but there is an awful lot of money there, mostly because Intel charges an arm and a leg for CPUs like the 6900K we've already seen. But the point here is pretty simple. The high end and the extreme high end PC market is really only a handful of million of units. AMD has no problems whatsoever supplying this entire market. And that was pretty much with worst case scenario on die size, only 30,000 wafers per month and only having a 75% yield. There will be no supply issue here. The only issue with supply will be how much does AMD want to supply to the market. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. How badly does AMD want the market share? Or do they just want to make money without putting too much pressure on Intel? Because as we know, Intel has a lot of manufacturing capability as well. This could end up as a bloodbath. If AMD gets too aggressive on prices and basically craters the cost of the high-end PC, this could turn into a bloodbath. My suspicion is that both companies would rather avoid that. In the past, Intel used its superior performance to keep AMD down. So even when AMD had decent parts, 
Intel could always charge just that little bit more for something a little bit faster and it really pushed the price of AMD CPUs down. The problem Intel has now is that for the past six or seven years, they have segmented the market so much that they have got almost zero wiggle room left. You've already seen the benchmarks. Ryzen is at least going to beat the 6800K in every benchmark. The 6800K currently retails for well over $400. For the past five years or so, AMD has been trying to flog Bulldozer, the 8350, for around $150 to $200. Even at $400, AMD makes a lot of money on Ryzen, but at $400, that makes the 6800K unbuyable. And if Intel has to push down the price of the 6800K to say $350, then that will have a knock-on effect on chips like the 7700K, which is currently retailing at $350. So if Intel has to push down the price of that to around $280, then they're going to need to push down the price of the i5s even further. People think that Intel are in a strong position here, but they're not, because Ryzen is clearly faster than the 6800K. And not only that, but I expect there to be two Ryzen CPUs capable of beating the 6800K. So one can be highly priced, and the other not quite so highly priced, but it doesn't end there. If you just look at the i5-7600K, four cores, no hyper-threading. I cannot imagine any scenario where Ryzen with four cores and hyper-threading loses to that i5 CPU. Right, so I was going to talk about the i5 and its Ryzen competition. However, once again, this video has lasted a little bit longer than I had anticipated, and I've decided to talk about that in a very near future video instead. So look out for that one very soon. I'll catch you later, guys.